morning. Hello attendees. Uh, it looks like our participants are logging in in rapid succession. We're very excited about all of the people joining us today and our great panel. I'm Danielle Casey. I'm the Executive Vice President here at the Greater Sacramento Economic Council and I am here simply for a few housekeeping notes and then to introduce our moderator for today's program. So in terms of housekeeping notes, we are recording this webinar like all of our other webinars. So following today's program, we'll be sending a post webinar survey. We definitely hope to hear from you and get your feedback regarding the program and, and potentially ideas for future programs. And, uh, and it'll uh, also include a link to the recording in that survey. So there's a little bit of extra incentive. And in about 24 to 48 hours, we will also have the recording up on the events page on our website if you wanna share it with anyone. If anyone has technical issues or difficulties or just general questions, please use the chat function today on your Zoom toolbar. But if you have a question for a speaker, please, please, if you can use the Q&A tool, that will help us uh, ensure that we're answering questions. And if for any reason we're unable to answer all the questions today, we can potentially follow up on those later if they are in the Q&A section. This webinar has been produced in partnership with Experis IT, an amazing partner of ours. They are located in Sacramento and are the technical arm of Manpower Group with more than 70 years of global workforce solutions expertise. They specialize in technical project solutions and professional resourcing across all areas of information technology. They have a scalable and flexible delivery model with expertise in connecting the right candidates to the right opportunities. And their expertise in verticals ranges from infrastructure, data analytics, development, information security, and outsourced managed services. We couldn't be more thrilled to partner with them on today's webinar, as well as if you missed it, our previous webinar last week and the third in the series that will happen next week. If you're not already registered, please do so. Um, the, the webinar from last week is also available via the recording on our COVID-19 page. Companies are now reevaluating business needs and reimagining the workplace in new and innovative ways as we acclimate to this new normal. So for today's program, we are gonna hear from industry leaders who have begun to navigate the next steps of reopening. And without further ado, I'm going to kick things over to Phil Scott. Phil is an amazing partner. He is the business and economic development consultant for the Greater Folsom Partnership. Um, and he also serves on our Economic Development Directors Task Force with Greater Sacramento, working with us day in and day out on regional strategies as well as efforts that support his community. Um, Folsom, uh, if you're not aware, it is a hotspot for technological innovation in the Greater Sacramento region. So we're thrilled to have him here with us today to moderate this panel. With that, Phil, the floor is yours. Great. Well, thanks for that introduction, Danielle. Uh, very kind words. And two things as we get started here today. Uh, one is, there's a saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I think that's really indicative of, of what we have here and certainly excited about the panel we have. And in some of these times, we see it as adversity. Uh, there's also opportunity that opens itself up. And so that's what I'd have everybody focus on. And on today's panel, we have Tamara Armstrong. She's the Associate Vice Chancellor, Information and Technology at Los Rios Community College District. And we also have Clifton Roberts, Director of Global Partnerships and Initiatives with Intel, which has a, a large campus here in Folsom, uh, along with Folsom Lake College, which is part of Los Rios. And then also we'll hear from Manveer Sandhu, CEO and co-founder of Zenify. So very, very excited about hearing from these three folks uh, being on the forefront of what's not only been here, but what's coming in the future in the face of COVID. And I'm, I'm optimistic that all three of them will have a, a bright outlook of how things will be different, but in a positive way. So uh, before we take the first questions, I'm going to have each of the panelists introduce themselves, give a brief introduction, and then we'll get into the questions. And so Tamara, if, if you would start us off with a short background and introduction, that would be great. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Um, I currently serve as the Associate Vice Chancellor of Information Technology for um, the greatest community college district in the world, in my opinion, Los Rios Community College District. Um, we um, have four uh, colleges, American River College, uh, Folsom Lake College, 
uh, Kasumas River College um, and Sacramento City College in the greater Sacramento area. And, and they span about 13 uh, campus locations. Um, as many of you know, we are a premier provider of on-ground education, and we're also a premier provider um, of online um, education. So we're excited to be able to serve 75,000 students um, in, our, in our area that is ab absolutely contributing um, to our workforce and development of our region in many, many ways. Um, personally, I have public and private sector experience um, in telecommunications, financial services, cybersecurity, and kind of all aspects of information technology. Um, I was raised and educated here in Sacramento. I'm a proud graduate of American River College, proud graduate of Sacramento State uh, University as well, and was able to um, attain my Master's of Business Administration in technology. So I'm happy to be here and contribute to the conversation. Thank you. Very good, thank you for that. Uh, Clifton, can we go ahead and have you uh, say some, some words about yourself? Absolutely. So Clifton Roberts, uh, Director of Global Partnerships and Initiatives with Intel Corporation. We're part of the Governments, Markets and Trade Group within Intel. Uh, part of my job is to reach out to governments around the world um, to advocate for not just Intel technology, but technology in general, which has been helpful during this situation. Um, I'm a Sacramento resident, have been since I moved here from Okinawa, Japan. Um, I'm a military brat, so I uh, came back after my junior year to attend high school here and then attend the University of California at Berkeley. And uh, let's see, I've worked for four companies. One was Payne Weber, which is now UBS when I first graduated. Uh, then I went to Nations Bank, uh, all in Sacramento. Then uh, uh, HealthNet Federal Services over in Rancho Cordova. And then I came over here to Intel, and I've been with Intel now for 10 years, and I'm very excited to be here. Thanks to Experience for inviting me to this very important conversation. Very good. Well, we're, we're definitely glad to have you as part of this. And Manbir, if you could go ahead and, and introduce yourself, that would be fantastic. Yeah, absolutely, Phil. So um, hello, everyone. My name is Manbir Sandu, and I'm the, the CEO at Zenify. And we are based here in Sacramento, but we also have a, a significant office in, in Boise, Idaho, as well as uh, amazing uh, remote folks throughout the country. And we specialize in digital transformation. So the topic at hand today is very near and dear uh, to my heart and our heart in that we help organizations with digital transformation, um, specifically focused on like the latest and greatest cloud and SaaS technologies like Salesforce or Encino or Amazon Web Services. Um, and we, uh, we've been around for about seven years and we, we've grown quite significantly uh, over the past few years. And so again, I'm excited to be here and discuss this topic. Great, well, we're, we're glad to have you and certainly even our organization and we talk about it as a digital handshake, which is inclusive of our social media and our web as a backbone is how are we coming across to people? I think it's gonna be more important now than ever for us to, to stay focused on that. So let's get started with the first question. And if I could direct that, uh, Tamara, if you could kick us off, how is your organization expected to behave now and in the next six months? And second part of that is what technologies are needed to adapt and maintain productivity? Yeah, so um, the six months, the future six months really are going to be building on what we've been doing for the last couple of months, right? The world, the world for all of us has changed pretty dramatically. Um, we have been committed to a better user experience, student experience, but certainly as we've now transitioned um, more to online um, education, we have a a stronger commitment to making student-centric design of our processes and technology one of our priorities. We have to do this in order to enable our people, which are our greatest asset, to be able to deliver high quality education. So what does that look like? That means a greater level of student engagement. We're not trying to introduce um, distance education courses, right, where students essentially mail it in. We are trying to engage our students in a very real and productive way that's gonna help them to be um, successful, right, in completing uh, their academic goals, um, completing their training um, goals. So for us, that stronger commitment and kind of redesigning how we um, have interaction with our students is one of our biggest priorities. And all of these things are being done in the middle of a budget crisis, right? 
And so for many of us, we are facing um, times that many of us haven't seen ever, others haven't seen in many, in many, many years. Um, so this is really uh, serious for us. The second uh, aspect in the context of today's world is really looking at equity in our systems and processes, right? So for us, that is a very big priority. This has been something that's core to our mission all along, but certainly we are taking a renewed look and looking at everything from how we design our systems, how we interact with our students, and really looking at the data and the outcomes very differently and being um, prepared um, and willing to advocate and push into uncomfortable situations to make changes to support equity. And, and IT is not spared from that, right? Because in this world, all of our students in our community are interacting um, in electronic format. So it's important that we look um, in that way. Lastly, the last three months were really about firefighting. And now we're looking into um, how do we optimize uh, our processes, right? We put some things in place. I think many people put things in place in a hurry, right? Trying to respond to this new environment. And now we're really in the process of saying, how do we make it better, right? How do we look at how we've architected things and, and, and look at things in a very different way? So transitioning from uh, the, the firefighting mode to now optimizing and also better preparing ourselves um, in the future if changes need to occur again. Some of us have moved back to an on-ground environment. Some of us are still in a fully online environment. So for us, the technologies really boil down to one, um, creating interactive uh, tools for our workforce and for our engagement with our students and community. So obviously we're using tools such as Microsoft Teams um, in a way that we're trying to advance, um, absolutely looking at more cloud-based um, services. I mean, really kind of promoting real-time collaboration. We just don't have time to rely just on email anymore, right? We really need to get more direct and more and more interactive. So uh, increasing that engagement, I think tools in that way, not just turning them on, but expanding adoption is gonna be something that we're gonna continue to see um, in the coming months. Um, I believe that um, everyone is looking very differently at cloud, right? When you have people that can't even access their buildings, right? People that were uninterested before have a greater interest in cloud technologies um, now. And so I think that, that looking um, at those transitions, given the investments that we already have in place, I think that will continue to grow um, for both automation and, and added technology services. And lastly for us, it is how do we track and manage our workload in a fully remote environment, right? And so that's very different when you can't go down and knock on the door, right, uh, for, your, for your coworkers. Um, how, do you, how do you manage that work? How do you make sure that we're um, operating across our outcomes, right, and measuring our work in those ways? So I think technologies, whether it's portfolio management or, you know, electronic Kanban boards or things like JIRA, you know, those are the things that we're looking at um, in a very meaningful way, not just turning it on again, but getting adoption, building those into our work so that we can deliver against outcomes and create better experiences for our students. Yeah, that's great. And your point's well taken about in light of budget constraints, now more than ever, leveraging technology is going to become massively important. Uh, so thank you for that. Clifton, uh, Manveer, anything else you'd like to add on this question? No, I, I think Tamara's feedback um, is excellent. You know, some of the tools that she talks about, the JIRAs and, you know, even the Slacks, you know, I think the technology part of it is there. That's the beautiful part of, you know, this new normal is that the technology is beyond kept up with the times. And so having those tools and those solutions at our disposal um, is fantastic during a tough time like this. I've heard from people that, you know, they're even more productive you know, than they were before, which is amazing just given what's going on uh, in the world today. So, so I echo a lot of tomorrow's feedback. Very good. Uh, Clifton, any thoughts? No, I, I loved what tomorrow said about, uh, you know, initially being in a situation where we're, you're putting out fires and, and being reactive and moving to this, um, this, this mode of now being um, proactive and optimizing. So I think that that was well said. And, you know, no matter if it's a smaller organization or a large organization like Intel with over 100,000 employees, uh, we've, we've moved from this reactive environment to one that's proactive and we're optimizing as well. So that was very well said tomorrow. Good, good, good. All right, let's move on then. Uh, question number two, 
Is your organization, organization considering a long-term culture shift to a remote working environment? And do you foresee a change to your IT workforce team skills? And Manveer, if you could take this one for us first, that would be great. Yeah, Phil, you know, what I, what I love about this question is the word culture. You know, culture at the end of the day is what, what brings the people of a firm together. And then during adversity, it's what holds them together, right? And so our culture gets tested during times like this. Interestingly enough, before COVID, if I look at late last year, um, we did an employee survey, like a focus group. And one of the big pieces of feedback that we received from our remote uh, employees was that they felt sort of connected from the mothership, you know, from our main offices, that we have a strong office culture, which is awesome. It's a great asset. We have these amazing offices and experiences, but we weren't always mindful of the full experience, right? Which includes people that were working from home. So before COVID hit, we were, you know, we had a concerted effort to, you know, make sure that we're just encompassing and in cult, uh, in, in embracing, you know, the fact that we have people, um, you know, working remotely and, you know, doing things like being on video consistently, but we were still inconsistent, right? So, so despite that, you still had like a, a 80, 20, 70, 30 thing going on. COVID, you know, when we shut down the offices, it level set everybody. Right, it baselined everybody to being at home. So the first thing that we had to do was make sure that everybody was equipped. And as I mentioned earlier, the technology um, is a blessing that we have the tools that we have, the Slacks, the Salesforce, the Google. Um, if I forgot a technology, no disrespect, but the, the technology is there, right? Um, but the cultural shift to leveraging that technology, you know, um, it's super interesting to see how people, you know, even from a dress perspective, you know, you've got the fancy blazer jacket up top and the shorts, you know, and so it's so a lot of those like, you know, cultural shifts, doing virtual happy hours and, you know, doing those types of things. And it felt temporary, like, okay, we're in this mode for a while. So let's like get used to it and make the best of it. But the longer time goes on and we see that this thing's kind of dragging out, um, and we've opened up our offices and it's been interesting to see the shift um, back to the office. And I think it's um, going to be really, really important to stay in touch with people. Uh, people are the most important part of this thing, you know, and culture is the glue. So what I feel great about moving forward is that for those organizations that have made the shift and they've been able to stay connected as an organization, I think those organizations are going to be strong and just fine moving forward because the technology is there, but we, you need all the other parts to be moving at the same pace. So um, we're just keeping a close eye on everything. And I look at it like if you have an office environment and you've been able to transition to remote, now you kind of have the best of both worlds, right? And you can leverage those assets um, as you see fit to best you know, drive your business. Yeah, this, that's great. And, and making sure that no one feels like they're on an isolated island by themselves, correct? Away from, away from the mothership. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, good. Uh, Clifton, any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I agree with Manveer totally. Um, the, the culture that was embedded in any organization prior to COVID, I think, provides the glue and the foundation for how you respond to, to similar crises. And Intel, um, you know, with, with uh, the new CEO uh, in Bob Swan about a year and a half ago that came aboard, uh, he basically published um, a set of six principles that was um, crucial to Intel's culture. And so when we made the announcement uh, locally and around the world that, you know, we should be working from home, except for people that had to work in, in our fabs, um, it, it was a seamless transition in terms of the requirements for change management and all of that stuff. And because we focused on our values, like being fearless and being inclusive and customer obsessed, um, acting as one intel, um, making sure that we do things with quality and truth and transparency. And to Manveer's point about inclusion, I, I actually kicked off um, an initiative to have happy hours. And so 
we remain close. Uh, we use the tools that IT and you know IT respond. Our IT uh, department responded um, with agility. Um, they were uh, very customer obsessed. So uh, it, it, you know I have to second Manvir's uh, thoughts on this. Is that culture and and the organization's values really? Uh, made for uh, easy transformation and adoption of the, the the new normal. Yeah, absolutely. And and then Tamara, we know that you've uh, the Los Rios has shifted everything to online already. Can you add some comments though here? How that may last long term? You know, I would say that uh, that certainly for us, we are looking at things very deliberately according to what our specialties are. Right? What is the function uh, that our people are performing? We absolutely want to um, advance our efforts to be ready at any time to be fully remote, right? Because we were caught off guard once. We don't want to be caught off guard anymore. Um, however, um, we recognize that certain specialties, certain lines of work um, um, have a different need, right? And may not um, continue um, forever um, remote. Um, many may. But I think what I'd like to point out is, is I believe Clifton mentioned the organizational change management. Because we're all working remotely doesn't mean that there's still not a need for organizational change management as we begin to transition into the future state, right? Because some people are still expecting and quite frankly waiting to get back into the office. And so to the extent that that, 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 that may change, right, we shouldn't overlook um, organizational change management in making that change to our culture and our environments. Some people are looking at this as a permanent thing, right? And if that doesn't change, they'll also, right, have um, feelings and perspectives about that. So I would just say looking at the work that we do, uh, looking at keeping our finger on the pulse of our customers and our employees, leveraging that organizational change management, and then also remembering, uh, for certainly for those of us in IT, generational differences are real, right? Specialties are real, and we have to um, be thoughtful about those things as we look to uh, the future, whether it's on ground, um, you know, all remote or some hybrid. Yeah, very good. Good input. Let's go on to the next question then is, and Clifton, if you'll take this one first, please, is how has your IT organization been adopting new ways of delivering the business outcome for your company, not just the IT requirements? And you, you touched on it with happy hours. Are there some other examples of ways that they're doing that? Absolutely. So our, I'm very proud of our IT organization. Um, they em fully embrace the, the Intel value of being customer obsessed and not just for our external partners and fellow travelers, but internally, um, as you can imagine, Intel is a company made up of, you know, 15 to 20 business units, whether it's data center group, CCG, um, which is our client compute group, our Internet of Things, autonomous driving, artificial intelligence, and me uh, working in, in the law and policy group, specifically governments, markets, and trade, they really um, pivoted and looked at our business requirements. And so gone now are the days where IT comes to us and says, here are our capabilities, take it. I'll give you a good example, Skype. You know, that was our one platform to have meetings. Um, and, and when COVID happened, one of the things we found was that the video capabilities, it kept dropping and, you know, in, in, in no fault, that might have something to, to do with bandwidth, but IT was very agile. They came to us and said, what are your business requirements? And we said, look, we wanna be able to have happy hours. We wanna be able to meet virtually. Good example even is our internship program. I had um, made some offers to three interns, uh, two from Duke University, one from University of California at Berkeley prior to COVID. And when it happened, we had to quickly shift and provide it as a virtual internship program. And so IT responded, um, set up their accounts, uh, mailed their computers to their home address of record. I mean, they were just extremely agile. And then they continued to come back to the business and say, what do you need? what can we do to help you provide the best experience for your partners and your customers and your fellow travelers? And in my job specifically, we engage with top government officials to scale programs like AI for youth or digital readiness for leaders. And so when we're asking these government leaders to come to workshops online, they're expecting a very enriching, robust, engaging and interactive experience. 
And so we've been able to go back to IT and they're coming to us now with a plethora of solutions to be able to choose from. So uh, again, gone are the days of just IT saying, here's what we have. They've been very responsive to the needs of the business and not just the needs of what IT is capable of. So we're really proud at Intel of the way that I, um, our IT department has responded. That, that's really great. And Manveer, it sounds like uh, even pre-COVID is that you had people out working remotely uh, and in different offices. Is there any other ideas that you want to put forward that have worked well uh, regarding this? You know, it's, um, so if you are, if you think about as you get into more complex um, projects that are highly technical in nature, where being in a room together you know, looking at somebody, looking at body language and whiteboarding, you know, was, was really critical to getting through bottlenecks, especially when it's a really complex systems challenge uh, or a business process challenge. So that was one of our biggest fears, you know, going into this thing is how do we drive these very, high, you know, complicated technical transformations with, you know, sophisticated banks you know, when everybody's remote, you know, and so we, the beauty of it is that, you know, it all came down to um, doing things like everybody's on video, right? And so having those protocols in place, you know, you can take breaks, but I need the video to be on. I need to be able to look at you, you know, as we're talking. Um, and then we, you know, we got creative with uh, like the whiteboarding features, leveraging Zoom, um, but then also, you know, the communication and organization before and after a meeting is also become really, really cr critical, right? Like, this is the agenda, this is the objectives. Um, and then having the follow ups after as far as the action items that were captured and the documentation that was captured, all of those things became that much more important. Um, in the event that there was ambiguity or there wasn't mutual understanding, you know, between people uh, operating off of a video only. So it's definitely been more challenging and there's been many situations where we've been like, man, I wish we could just get on a plane and fly and meet and like we can knock something out in two hours that's been taking us, you know, weeks and weeks to resolve. So some of those nuances and complexity, you know, are going to be there, but we're getting better and better at it, right? It's not the technology part of it. It's more of the human part of it. Yeah, for, for sure. And we've even experienced in GSEC is the availability to get more people together faster uh, than what it may have taken before. And so there's, there's definitely benefits and uh, some, some detractions. Tamara, anything you wanna add on this topic? You know, I would just echo that we've seen greater engagement um, in certain aspects because before, again, I think we have 2,400 service area miles that we serve. And, you know, having people drive around, right, to get together, you know, it, it, it takes up a lot of time, right? It takes up productivity time. So I think the ability that we can pull people in um, has been great. We also are trying to deal with the all day Zooms that we're trying to uh, manage, but, but we're still working through that. That's a challenge. One of the big things that I would say that's been great for us is that um, we have moved, it's been, COVID has been the catalyst rather for us to look at iterative delivery, right? And so for us, instead of saying, we're gonna get it all nice and pretty and all perfect, right? And then deliver it, it really has, it really has given us a greater permission to say, let's get the first release out, right? And we're gonna build on it, we know it's not perfect. And people have been more patient, right? Maybe than they would have been normally because they want it fully baked, right? But, but they know that we're delivering as we get stuff done. And that incremental value um, has been good to have as opposed to just waiting. So that's something that we've been adopting um, new ways and, and, and looking at that. Our, our releases are coming a lot more often um, in, in, a, in a lot of different areas. So that's been good for us. Good. Yeah. Good, good. All right, let's go on to our next question then. And uh, Tamara, let's go ahead, if you could take this one for us is, how do you see the future of IT and technology in your workforce evolving over the next one to three years? And second part of that, how does your organization need to evolve to meet these expectations? 
So I will go back to, um, you know, kind of the theme of our budget, right, challenges. And again, I think that this is across private and public sector. Um, they're really, they're very real. And as I mentioned before, we did a lot initially uh, to, to transition to this fully remote um, environment. And I think what all of us in tech um, and in kind of the business world have to address is that we're going to have to evaluate what we threw into place and to decide is that something that we want to scale or stop, right, or improve. And I think in some ways it's going to take a lot of courage for us to look at something that we did and be able to say, you know, we did it with the best intentions or it may have worked for a short amount of time, but it's really not the best place for us to, con to continue to invest, right, going forward. It's not, the, it's not necessarily driving um, the outcomes that we need or um, the expense may be more than we can uh, maintain given that we've got investments in different places. So I think that for us, certainly we're gonna have to look at um, stopping or changing things that we may have done, uh, even if it's a cool thing that has a lot of potential, right? <laughs> we may have to cut bait um, on some of those um, things. And we have to really prioritize a simplification of our architecture, simplifying our experience for our students because we believe that that's what's gonna make them uh, more successful is delivering uh, what they need. I think certainly student experience is something that's really important to us and ultimately the outcomes. So um, we're trying to build a student experience that doesn't um, assume that our students have the best and the brightest um, you know, computers and broadband and everything else, right? So we're trying to architect solutions that says, what if our student doesn't have you know, um, you know, high speed, right? What if, what if our student doesn't have you know, the nifty cool right, computer that, that, you know, that, that has the, all the processors. What, what, how do we provide them a great experience and to further their academic goals? So those are some of the things that we really um, think are going to evolve and continue to evolve. We're investing heavily in making sure our students have um, what they need almost as a basic needs, right, commitment for our um, campus. But I think that's, that's going to be an important um, aspect. Um, I think continuing to look at artificial intelligence um, is going to be something that, that we're looking for opportunities um, in as well. I think you'll see it across uh, the board, continued interest um, in that. And then again, back to that continuous delivery um, DevOps and using data in our decision making to drive what's next, right? What do we do next? What do we stop doing? I think those are, those are keys that we're going to see over the next one to three year kind of resolving technical debt and making sure that um, that we are uh, simplifying in the in this very difficult financial situation. Very good, uh, Manveer, your thoughts on this? Yeah, so you know, Tamara made some great points that I want to touch on as well. But we we help organizations with digital transformation. It's it's what we do. It's our passion. And you know, before COVID, you know, eighty percent of the organizations we you know work with, talk with, were either contemplating a major digital transformation or they were going through one and it wasn't going quite the well, you know, the way they wanted it to. What COVID has done is it, it's accelerated all that, right? It's exposed it in some cases. It's created a, a sense of urgency for organizations to want to drive that transformation and get to the next level. Um, one of the things that's super interesting is, you know, the, the psychological fear of failure right? When it, when it comes to wanting to take on a transformation, it's, it's huge. And, you know, the perception around what it takes, you know, from an overall timeline and budget perspective um, is also, you know, a real challenge. And so one of the things that we try to do is, you know, working with our partners like a Salesforce, for example, um, you know, the technology has improved to the extent that you can actually do something. You can get something done inside of a year. You can not only do those agile things that tomorrow was talking about to show some quick wins and some progress and to build that trust and confidence that you can get something done, but you can actually achieve something quite transformative, right? Including the data side of it. Usually the mess is in the data, right? You have information in five or six or eight different systems. You know, how do I go through this Herculean task of bringing it all together? Uh, it used to be really, really challenging. Um, from a technology perspective, but the newest, latest SaaS and cloud technologies have made it a lot more seamless. They've made it easier. They've made it declarative. They've made it something that you can get done inside of a year. Um, and that's 
really inspiring and encouraging. And so our job is to, you know, open up people's eyes and minds to those possibilities. And it's the psychological part of things. It's the human side of things that's oftentimes the most challenging, right? The change management, the willingness to embrace the technology, the willing, willingness to change, you know, to drive those process changes. Um, oftentimes, there's things that are used as a scapegoat here and there, like security is one that I hear a lot about. And security is legit, don't get me wrong. Like, you know, having security as part of your overall infrastructure is essential. But again, the technology is advanced. You know, it's better than it's ever been and it's only going to improve. So it's one of those things where people will throw up walls to, you know, impede their progress or not want to move or not want to progress. And, you know, the more the technology advances, the better the opportunity we have to, you know, partner with organizations and to really show them what's possible um, and then really help them organize their efforts. You know what I mean? Like, how do you prioritize? How do you drive those roadmaps? Tomorrow we're talking about prioritization. All those exercises are incredibly important, but you have to do those in the context of what is it that you're trying to achieve given the change that's happened, right? And what are the things that you're willing to trade off? And what are the things you absolutely essentially have to drop to be able to, you know, achieve this other objective? And so those are all exercises that I, I think organizations are going through and they're having some reality checks and it's all a very healthy thing. We're going to come out of this thing better. We're going to come out of it stronger as organizations, as a region here in Sacramento. So we're really excited about the possibilities. So yeah, that's really great. And it, it reminds me, I've got a, a bumper sticker, change is inevitable, struggle is an option, right? And as it relates to adopting the, the human component of advancing technology, it's not really the technology, it's us as humans being willing to change. So uh, it's a, that's a good segue. And then uh, Clifton, any final thoughts on this question? Yeah, absolutely. This question means a lot. Um, you know, obviously to all of us on the call, but specifically to Intel, you know, it makes me think of our founders of Intel. Um, back in 1965, I, I'm hoping I'm getting that date right. Um, I better right. Uh, Gordon Moore, uh, he made a prediction that I thought, I think would set the pace for what we look at as a modern digital revolution. And through his careful observation, uh, he, he, he kind of noticed this emerging trend and he extrapolated that the uh, computing world would dramatically see increases in power, uh, decreases in cost and, and, and do so at a very exponential pace. And that became known as Moore's Law. And it actually became like this golden rule for um, not only just the semiconductor industry, but for many of the OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers that we work with and, and, and ODMs as well, and became a springboard for innovation. <clears throat> and, um, and, and so I like to go back to that, uh, to, to Gordon Moore, because as a co-founder, um, he set the tone for the way that Intel um, innovates. You know, we're always striving to, to, to do, to make things faster, to make them smaller, to make them more affordable for our customers. And IT has really embraced that. So I, I, I see no other option for our IT organization to embrace that golden rule as they move forward. And we've seen it in some of the technologies uh, that they've come up with, not only, you know, not, not only because of COVID, but even before that, um, Intel Unite, for example, is a conferencing technology, and we've been able to move that from the conference room to when we just get on a call with our peers and our colleagues around the world. So over the next one to three years, you'll see Intel in our ID IT department really embrace uh, Gordon Moore's, you know, Moore's law and, and try to do things faster, quicker, and uh, with, with internal and external customers in mind. Yeah, that's really good. And, and uh, certainly moving on from uh, when I first got here 30 years to Folsom, we were, what, at the 386 is my recollection uh, in the chipset world. So hopefully we, we keep progressing on from, from where we're at even today. So uh, thank you for those. 
All right, and that, that takes us uh, to our, our last question here. Uh, and Manvira, if you could take this one first, please. What does digital transformation and adopt, adaptation mean to our, your company and how you are driving it? How are you driving that, that transformation and adaptation? Yeah, so for us, you know, innovation is at the core, right? And innovation um, has a, as a technology component, but it also has a component of, you know, how we change the way that we do business, how we change our behaviors, how our consumers' habits are changing, you know, moving forward, whether it's um, in a, an e-commerce environment or whether it's in a banking environment. So the way that we approach things is really about taking that, that more of that industry focus and looking at, for example, through the eyes um, of a bank, and we work with a lot of banks, um, as well as uh, insurance and mortgage organizations, and viewing things from the perspective of those businesses, you know, how have things been, how are they today, and what can happen moving forward? How are those industries being disrupted um, by technology pure plays? How can they get in on the action Right, and I think that's the the challenge for a lot of organizations is you know they see innovation happening around them, but then how do I make it pertinent to us? You know, Tamara mentioned artificial intelligence. There's also blockchain. There's all these great words that are out there, right? What do they mean? You know, how do you translate that into tangible business value for your customers? So we always take that lens um, as we're working with organizations around transformation. And then from there, you can start to translate it into the building blocks, right? You know, what does the architecture need to look like, right? What are the fundamental changes that have to be made um, over the course of time? You know, chunk down into intervals, you know, iteratively, as Tamara mentioned, you don't have to do it all in one shot, right? It doesn't have to happen as a big bang. You can do it in smaller increments and you can drive those changes and drive adoption um, and then move to the next phase. You know, it's a great time to do things in a, in a pilot or a proof of concept uh, perspective. We started our firm on the concept of a POC. You know, we had a theory that something could be done and that the technology could help drive that. But we didn't sort of do it all in one shot. You know, we did it in a, in a smaller iterative chunk to prove it uh, to ourselves as much as anybody else. And that's, that's generally the, the principle and the methodology that we use uh, around digital transformation. Very good. Uh, Clifton, anything you want to add? Yeah, digital transformation and adaptation is basically why Intel exists. I mean, we, you know, 50 years ago, we foresaw the need for computers and uh, compute power. And you need only look at our, our, our purpose and our mission in our vision, you know, our purpose and why we exist at Intel is to create world te uh, changing technology that enriches the lives of every single person on earth. And it's one of the reasons why I'm very proud to work at Intel. Me specifically working in the government's markets and trade group, I have uh, the, the good fortune of being able to interact with top government officials around the world and look at some of the problems that they're trying to solve at a massive level for every single one of their citizens. And it requires digital transformation and adapting to a very fast paced and, and fast changing environment. So um, that's what we're here for. Our IT department has fully embraced it. And not only that, every single one of our business has fully embraced what our purpose is, which is to enrich the lives of every single person on earth. It's an audacious goal um, but every day we see, you know, even us on this call right now, um, more than likely, I'm hoping that we're using computers that uh, the brains behind that computer is an Intel chip. And if, even if you look at things like the Internet of Things and our artificial intelligence capabilities and autonomous driving to save lives, we uh, understand the need to transform digitally. We understand the need of countries around the globe um, now having digital economies uh, versus, you know, people going into normal brick and mortar places. 
So uh, it, it means a lot, and I'm really glad that you asked that question. Good. Well, thank you for the response. And Tamara, can we finish this off here with your last thoughts on this question? Yeah, you know, I just want to point to a couple of things that Clifton said, and I know we want to get to the questions because we're interested in those as well. Um, our job at Los Rios, I think, if yours is to make world-changing technologies, ours is to make world-changing people, right? And so our, we have a lot of ways to impact our community, our region, and we're excited about that. Um, one of the things you also mentioned, Clifton, was uh, the work that you've done with your IT shop. And for me, if I look at this last question about digital transformation, it does imply technology, but I would just assert that it's about partnership, right? And I believe that we have to invest um, heavily in our partnership. And as I was thinking about this term, I said, well, what does partnership mean? And some of the terms that came out are joint interest, right? And to me, that's something that is compelling. We have to, as an IT shop, be as interested about outcomes, right, as our business and program partners are. And being a partner also means that you are in cooperation, right? Collaboration, coalition, and alliance. And so to me, if I look at digital transformation, it's going to require us, right, to be hand in glove, right, with those that are um, identifying the outcomes, um, um, know what our students or customers um, need, and really being that present and engaged partner uh, to making um, our worlds, right, providing the technology that they need to, to provide fertile ground, right, to delivering, and certainly for our case, to delivering that, that experience to our students very directly, very intimately, and in a way that meets them, right, this continuum of education, whether it's on ground or on demand, we've got to be excellent at every aspect um, of that continuum. And so I think that partnership is going to be really important, and that is how um, I think we'll be open to whatever digital transformation adaptation means. So I'm excited about the concept of education without limits, right, through those partnerships. That's great. Yep. And uh, we all know is that together is when we're strongest and those partnerships are going to be more important now than they've ever even been. So it's, it is definitely exciting times. And uh, with that, let's, let's get with some of our partners. We see there's a couple of questions that have come in in the Q&A. If you have questions, please go ahead and type those in. Uh, we'll go ahead and, and jump on. There's two that came in from Mark Anderson. Thank you, Mark. Uh, his first one is, did employees want to go back into the office and specifically questioning Manveer, when you reopened the office, did employees want to go back and what percentage went back? Yeah, um, so so great question. I, you know, I would say that at this point, there is, there's, there's not a big hurry. Um, <laughs> uncomfortable as people have been, you know, working at home, because you got to imagine, not everyone had that amazing setup at home. And a lot of our employees also have their kids at home for a very long extended period of time, by the way. So we went right from spring, you know, where the kids were at home into summer and you're like, wow, this is like the longest summer ever. And I usually can't wait for summer to end because I need the kids to get out of the house and back to school. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it's been really challenging in that regard. And people, um, while people are uh, very productive in this new normal, um, there's, they're also overworked to some extent, you know, they're stressed out, but despite that discomfort, they have adapted, you know, to that uncomfortable and we're not seeing a big rush for people wanting to come into the office and there's still the fear, right, of um, catching the virus. It's a very legitimate fear. And I totally understand and respect that. And, you know, that's kind of where we are today. You know, I think it's gonna be a very slow trickle. Um, I think what happens in the fall with school, by the way, um, in, your, in your various regions is gonna be huge. You know, like, are the kids gonna be able to go back to school or is it gonna be at home? And that's gonna be a big driver of what happens in the office place, you know, throughout the rest of the year. So we just have to stay very connected to our people um, and very connected to what's going on from a health perspective. Yeah, and it was, it was interesting on one of our other presentations sponsored by GSEC, Steve Fleming, River City Bank, made the comment he'd been in banking for 40 years and never thought that they would be having people doing things remotely and that it has worked much beyond what they ever imagined and that they weren't in a hurry to bring people back. 
you know, as indicative of the banking industry. Uh, so yeah. if that ever, uh, for me, highlighted anything. Uh, Tamara, anything else that you would like to add on, on that same question that Mark had asked? If I can just add something that Nan had mentioned to us is that um, he mentioned that they had designed, right, this really great space, right, that was supposed to be a magnet, right, for people. And so knowing that, that your employees have a great place to work, right, um, and then listening to you say, oh, they're not rushing back, right, that, that kind of tells you the severity, right, of the situation uh, that we're in and the opportunity to work in a great collaborative space is something that once you've worked in it, you're like, this is amazing, right? And you really value. And so to hear that people are saying, even despite that great space, right, this environment is working for me, or I have concerns, right? And I'm not ready um, to go back. I think that it's not a concept that shouldn't be foreign, right, to the rest of us. I'm really um, saying that people are making individual decisions, right? Some people would much rather prefer to be at work, perhaps in Manbeer's really cool space, you know, but their reservations about COVID are saying, I'm going to stay home, right? Others, right, are like, I just like working from home. So I think that, you know, again, looking at our staff, uh, making sure that, um, that, that they don't get shortchanged because they're at home. I think the opportunity to, to continue to develop them, right, is something that we're all having to explore. What does professional development look like, right, in our current um, environment? How do you train and coach people up so that they can be successful in this environment if they've never worked there before. I think those are all um, opportunities, but I just appreciate it when Man Beer said, you know, we've got this great space and we're struggling with being in it. So thank you for that, Man Beer. Thank you. Good. And it, you know, this, uh, another question just came in from Rico Rivera that's applicable. Do you think that this pandemic will show employers who the employees are who can handle and might uh, can handle working from at home and who can't and might need to come in regularly? That's a tough one. Clifton, you want to take that one? <laughs> you know, um, okay, I can only speak for Intel. I remember being on a call with our general counsel and uh, he reports directly to our CEO and someone asked him, uh, his name is Steve Rogers. They said, Steve, have you noticed an increase in productivity or a decrease in productivity or has productivity remained the same since this stay at home order? And his, I mean, he didn't even have to think about it. He said, I've actually seen an increase in productivity. Now, this may be a different situation for him because his group is largely made up of lawyers and policymakers um, like myself, right? Uh, so for, for Intel specifically, th there hasn't been an opportunity to identify people that aren't quote unquote cut out for this virtual environment. And as a matter of fact, our CEO announced that we do have the capability if we choose even when we phase in um, going back to work, and I'm sure you guys have probably heard about Intel's plans within Folsom to do a phased approach to return back to work, four phases. Um, but we have the, the, the option to be able to work through the rest of the year from home. Um, we have the best of both worlds at Intel because as you know, even our partners and colleagues and peers around the world, uh, some of them still are going to work in our, in our fabs. And it's interesting, there's an interesting story there. Intel was one of the, the few companies that were already built to respond to this pandemic. Because you remember, it was about covering your face and, and making sure that um, there was social distancing. Well, as you know, the inside of a chip factory is probably one of the cleanest places that you can visit on earth. Mm -hmm. I mean, to avoid contamination of a chip or the chip making process, you know, that the clean room that our chips are manufactured in is filtered. I think it's like 1,000 times, it filters 1,000 times fewer airborne particles than a sterile hospital, a sterile hospital room, uh, operating room. So, you know, we, we still have our, our peers that are going into work um, with no complaints. And um, we haven't been put in that situation to, to identify yeah. folks that, that ha are having a difficult time working from home. Yeah, you, you know, if anything, Clifton, you brought up that there was a, a class of interns that you guys onboarded 
during the time frame. And we, we did the same. It wasn't on boards. It was, you know, full-time professionals that had come out of, a, um, you know, like a code camp, you know, technology uh, accelerator type environment. And we were really worried, you know, they weren't going to have their, you know, the, the normal physical support system around them uh, to help them troubleshoot or to help them overcome questions. And the reality is, is they, they passed the test with flying colors, right? They did an unbelievable job. Um, I think some of that had to do with the fact that they did online learning to begin with. Mm. So they already came in very ready. And so some of the things that uh, Tamara and Los Rios offer as programs are going to be very well suited for new employees to come into an environment that's very virtual and just kill it, you know, and, and, and rock it. So, it. so it is interesting that what, what we're seeing is the opposite happen, right? We're seeing people that ordinarily you thought, wow, they're going to struggle maybe, um, you know, we need the face-to-face -face, and they've been able to overcome that, you know, leveraging technology and then obviously the, the cultural components that we talked about earlier. Yeah. Yep, very good. Well, thank you all for engaging conversation and answering the questions from the audience. I think it's been a very valuable conversation for sure. And I'm looking forward to hearing how our conversation continues to shift as things and, and the adaptations that occur. If you still have questions about any of the resources that were mentioned today or anything else that was not addressed, I saw Colleen and Walt uh, had some questions. Uh, please go ahead and make sure GSEC will be sending out a follow-up survey to everyone on today's call. You can submit your remaining questions that you have through that survey and they'll get you an answer and at the very least get you connected to somebody who can help answer your question. Uh, this webinar is part two of a three-part series produced by GSEC in partnership with Experis IT and on your screen now coming up is the information on the final installment of the series which will take place next Tuesday, June the 30th from one to two. So a different time slot than today. Today we're 11 to 12. Next week will be from one to two. Make sure you get that into your calendar. And now we're at the end of today's program and in the interest of time management, I wanna pass it over to GSEC CEO, Barry Broom and great guy to provide some uh, final thoughts for us. Barry. Thank you, Phil. And thank you, everybody. So that was a very exciting conversation. So the move, all these changes are coming. It's an economic developer's dream because when people talk about this old economy being gone, I always like to remind people, you know, it wasn't an economy I wanted in the first place. 44% of the African-American families in our region, 40% of Latinx were struggling financially six months ago. 50% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. So who wants an economy where half of your citizens are living paycheck to paycheck? I don't want that kind of economy. So I'm glad it's gone. I didn't want it to go all at once and take 40 million people with it. But you know, now we get a chance to completely rethink everything. And we're all sitting here uh, in our basements rethinking everything. And uh, so a couple of things I want to close with. One, this notion of shared values. So to me, you know, the move forward as a region is around shared values. So uh, GPAC or GSAC and the Greater uh, Sacramento Urban League have written a proposal to train 100 disadvantaged young adults with hard certifications in Microsoft or Salesforce or Google. One of, this is going to be like the Apollo astronaut program for digital inclusion. We need employers to work with us and hire these graduates. I've taken on the responsibility of placing all 100 graduates. We hope to roll that out in under 30 days. The Urban League will do the client management. General Assembly out of San Francisco, which is highly regarded by Salesforce, uh, Intel's work with them, uh, Microsoft works with them, Google is gonna do the training. So these kids are gonna have hard certification. They may not all be kids, some may be young adults, some may be dislocated workers. So the difference between shared values and corporate, spon corporate social responsibility. So I worked with Craig Barrett very closely in Phoenix. So I know Craig Barrett really well. He's the chairman of the board of Intel. I know his wife, Barbara Barrett, who uh, was, the, was an ambassador under uh, President Bush. And he was a big believer in corporate responsibility. And Intel has been a backbone for corporate responsibility in our community. So I wanna thank Intel for that. Shared responsibility is, and shared values is a step deeper. 
Whereas, you know, as we bring uh, our, inclu our inclusive economic model forward, of course, there's an element to it that is, you know, sympathy, but it's really economic power for all of us. You know, raising the incomes and raising the competitive skills of all of our residents will lead to greater profits at Intel. It'll lead to greater profits at Golden One. It'll lead to better jobs at Inductive. It'll lead to better kids going to UC Davis and Sacramento State. It's not a sympathy play. It's an empowerment play. And I think as we see our challenges in our communities as shared values and economic opportunities, it really gives us a chance to take changing our economy from an inclusion standpoint and a wealth standpoint as a serious business practice of our corporate leadership. And that's what the 42 CEOs on our board are committed to doing. Not philanthropy, not charity, but real community empowerment. And I want to thank everybody for being here today. And I want to let everybody know we're not going to let anyone down. We're going to get there. And I'm excited. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, very Darryl, good. Thank everybody. you for the update. Thank you, everybody. Thank you uh, for our panelists. Uh, thank you, Barry and the Danielle, the GSEC team. As always, we appreciate what you do for our region. And uh, this is exciting times for us to lean into and really come out stronger. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. See you next week. <laughs>